Okay, welcome uh, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We've got uh, people from uh, all parts of the world here and uh, we're joined by Daniel Ehrenreich uh, there in Israel uh, and I'm uh, recording uh, this session uh, from Sydney as well. We're going to be covering uh, business continuity preparedness and disaster recovery preparedness for industrial control, uh, control systems uh, and uh, thank you again uh, for joining us. This is a uh, quite a um, a unique topic uh, in so to speak. So the audience that we do have uh, are quite specialists in their field and, uh, and dedicated in their particular uh, realm. This follows on, Daniel and I have known each other for uh, a couple of years now. We did a, a podcast episode uh, on ICS cybersecurity uh, back in Singapore uh, for the cybersecurity conference in 2018. Uh, and we hosted Daniel here in Sydney and in Perth last year uh, for cybersecurity uh, and ICS and SCADA cybersecurity workshops. So that was a two day workshop and on this is a, about a half an hour session just to get an insight into Daniel's uh, expertise. Uh, and we're obviously in uh, a time of uh, sort of crisis management and business continuity management uh, also. Uh, so I'm sure you'll get uh, quite a deal out of this. In terms of uh, Daniel's background also, uh, we covered some 40 plus years uh, and in obviously starting in engineering, Motorola, Siemens, Waterfall, and uh, for the last half a dozen years, um, consulting and the like. So you'll find him a, a valuable resource. Um, and in terms of the context of this particular webinar, um, if you, you can, uh, beg your pardon, I went one slide too many. Uh, sorry, this does cover off, sorry, one slide. Um, the global standard ICA, uh, ISA and IEC 62443, Industrial Automation and Control System Cybersecurity Workshop. This is a slight taster, I suppose, in terms of this field. Um, and uh, if any of those of you are interested in this particular field further, in terms of SCADA, uh, Industrial Control System Cybersecurity, uh, stay in touch with us. We'll keep the, uh, the content coming to you uh, also, and there'll be more sort of webinars in this particular uh, field. Uh, and again, in terms of um, Daniel's expertise and where he is in the world, uh, no doubt uh, you'll gain some valuable insight there. Um, the context for this webinar is a, a Q&A uh, to follow, but if you do have uh, some questions as Daniel moves through his presentation, uh, welcome to raise your hand. There's a sort of a, a menu bar on your right where you can ask questions uh, and raise your hands there. I will sort of moderate the session. So if you have a question or you want to sort of interrupt Daniel on a particular topic that he's covering, uh, please use that, uh, that tool and I'll be there monitoring uh, that as well. So Daniel, I'm gonna hand over to you uh, over there one moment. There you go. So Daniel, thanks very much for joining us in Israel. Okay, good afternoon to all the connected uh, people from, uh, from Australia. Uh, good morning to connected people from Israel and Europe. And uh, thank you for, thank you, Chris, and thank you to the team of My Security Media for hosting this uh, presentation. Uh, basically, this, this presentation is a sort of continuation to what we discussed during the frontal presentations. Uh, last year in Sydney and Perth, where we discussed the basic of industrial control system and basic of industrial control system cybersecurity. This time, uh, we'll be focusing on what needs to be done in order to be better prepared uh, for anything what can happen. We will talk, we will talk about business continuity, preparedness, uh, disaster recovery, and all the preparation actions. And I can say that uh, just last a uh, few days ago, we have a cyber attack on one of the water utilities in Israel. And uh, a, a pump was burned because the attackers changed the configuration and you can see why you can imagine why this happened. Most probably it happened because people did not adhere to the best practices, how to protect industrial control systems related to remote access, 
related to locking the using quality PLCs, locking the programming capability, and so on. So let's discuss now the 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 topic which deals how can we be better prepared for such an action. So first of all, most important is to is to is to see your own uh, architecture. This picture is taken from the standard uh, IEC 62443, and you can see here the important uh, zones in any operation, which is the control zone, the safety instrumentation zone in the center. Then we have a secured connection to the IT zone. I must uh, clarify that the ICS and the IT zone are not converged, what many people are using the term ITOT convergence. They are not, and probably they will never converge. This is a mistaken term, and I want to explain it. The ICS or I Industrial Automation Control System, IACS, and the IT system are separately built, separately commissioned. However, they are securely connected in order to achieve higher uh, productivity and easier maintenance. So at the moment, these systems are connected and the IT system is connected to the internet, we already have a reason for externally generated cyber attacks. However, even if the systems are not connected, there is still opportunity for internally generated cyber attacks, such as happened the, the famous one, the Stuxnet attack, which was a operation disconnected from the internet and the, and the, the system was attacked. We had a few years, I think a year ago, we had the incident in the Middle East where the security instrumentation system was accessed. Why? Because of negligent, of negligent uh, 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 maintenance by people. So when we are when we are looking at the possibilities, uh, how a industrial control system can be attacked. So very sorry, there is a long list of possibilities, and you really need to, to look at each and a, and every attack vector or type of attack, but most important is what you can see on the top, the people factor. And there is a statistics that about 80, 90, 95%, very high percentage of uh, successful cyber attack happened because of negligent action by people. And this is the first thing that we have to resolve when we are dealing about cyber security. Just to say, mention again, because this is very important, that there are three attack vectors which we need to separate the address. We always talk about the externally generated cyber attack through the internet, always starting with social engineering, the attacker can be sitting in your network 100 to 200 days before he's detected. Then we must talk about the, the internally generated attack that people can bypass your physical security and, the, and insert a USB or a, a infected the service computer. And finally, we need to talk about the supply chain attack because there are so many possibilities that your service providers, your, so your software providers, all can, by reason, supply you a, a product or a return you repair product where attack is, uh, is or in the, the malware is already injected. Why this is so important? Because when we are talking about, about business continuity preparedness and disaster recovery, first thing we need to know, where is the risk from where uh, the attackers uh, might arrive? And once we have a clear picture of all, all these things, then we can start preparation. When we talk about what can happen and how severe the attack uh, can be, so this picture is, is taken from the 
6243 standard. And you, and you can see here the two, the two main factors, the probability of an attack, what we can estimate, how important it is for an attacker to attack our operation, and the impact. What can happen? It can be a, a minor impact. It may be a short outage, or it can be a major impact, damage to equipment, and the, in worst case, risk to lives of people. So you can see that the green colors are uh, okay. You can uh, slightly relax. I'm not saying you not to be prepared, but relax. But when you are getting to the to the red colors, then of course you can see your facility being damaged. And why this is important in, uh, related to BCP and DRP? Because once you see the picture and once you, once you see this color, this will immediately uh, make you to decide how to be prepared. This picture is from my uh, last year presentation. And you can see that the, the, the green box in the bottom is the normal operation. And if you are not well prepared, if you don't have the, the training of people, if you don't have the right policies in, play, in place, and you don't have the capability to react effectively and quickly, then of course the attack, the consequences of the attack will escalate, and you may have finally a major outage, damage, and uh, risk to life. So preparation is highly critical. When we talk about the, the basic principle of the business continuity to uh, preparedness. Very important is you need to know what you have. That's, this is the most critical. You need to have a great picture, a accurate documented picture of what is, what is uh, installed. Uh, and of course, when you, when you have this picture, then you know what kind of spare parts uh, you have in your, in your uh, warehouse to be ready. You need to have the, the people with the defined roles after these people were trained about what each of them will do when, when uh, such an event will, will happen. You need to do drills. No, it's impossible to run a theoretical preparation. You need, you need to uh, run simulations. Okay, this is happening. Who is doing what? Who is acting? How we are going to continue continue to work? And obviously, the, we are not dealing here with how to prevent an attack. We are dealing here at this moment with a situation that the attack already happens, and you need to and you need to assure continuous operation. Finally, when we are talking about DRP, the Disaster Recovery Plan, this is, of course, we are starting from the point that the, that the event already happened. And the, how we are preparing our organization. I already mentioned that the people, how people were trained, what kind of drills uh, we conducted during the past month, past years, in order to test their operation. Uh, how, we are, how we are dealing with, we need to focus on the most critical uh, areas in our facility. If, if there is a boiler, obviously a boiler is critical because if it goes out of control, there is a risk. If you have a, another area, for example, a water supply, maybe that water supply, if you shut down the water supply for a short time, this is not so critical. When we are defining the goals for the DRP, we are talking about two factors. The return, return time objective, how long, the, the facility can be inactive. How much time I have to prepare the facility and bring it back to operation. And in case there is a situation that I might lose data 
about the operation or of our facility, I need to be prepared. Okay, if I lose the data, I can return uh, one week or one month and recover all the data. So I need to, may, obviously I don't need the data uh, what happened 10 years ago, but I definitely need data what happened last month or last week. This is very critical. When, when, we, go, when we go to details about the BCP, we, we need to go, uh, we very organized what must be protected. And the, they do a mapping of the organization and the facility. How the attack affect our organization. We will have an outage, we will have a damage, we, we might have a fire, we need to dispatch the fire department. What, what can happen? And this should uh, instantly uh, go into the, into the program. We need to make a list of all the business continuity preparedness measures and the sort them by, by the effectiveness. So first of all, I already mentioned, I'm going to repeat it, understand the, what you have installed and access to all the information, detailed knowledge of all your processes because if the separate process is going out of operation, you need to be, you need to understand or you need to have people on site to understand the process. Protecting your physical perimeter is always important because when something happens, there might be a chaos and maybe some attackers have a two-step attack, so they wait for the chaos in your facility and then something a more severe can happen. The security controls in each zone, we already know that this, that the organizations divided to zone, we already know which is critical, which is high risk, and we need to deal with that. And of course, periodic inspection of all the, of all the processes, including what happens with your supply chain. Security assessment. Security assessment is always very important uh, because this will give you the picture of uh, about what you need to know. It helps you to prepare the, a list of improvements uh, based from the previous study what needs to be done. You can do benchmarking with other organizations and, or, and constantly you must improve and monitor all your processes. Coming back again, focus on the most critical and severe impacts. Why? Because, oh, we, we all know what is the most important. Uh, we are not talking about confidentiality of data. We are talking about safety. We start with safety of, of safety of people, a safe operation of uh, equipment and appliances, and uh, then we go to reliability and uh, and so on. If we cannot resolve something, uh, we know there is a problem, we need to have some type of complementing and compensating security measures. And when we need, when we need to uh, deploy something additional, we need to uh, analyze it, what benefits. And don't forget that if, if, you, are the, if you are deploying a new, sol a new solution, you may introduce new risk and, and this can be a problem. When we speak about the challenges, okay, we, I already mentioned, so I'm not, I'm not going to, to repeat everything, but prepare alternative solutions for this business continuity is very important. Very important is to know where are your backup, backup files, how accurate they are, how updated they are where they are stored in your facility, or maybe you have an additional backup in a remote facility, how quickly, how quickly you can access that. Speaking about the emergency response team, you need to be prepared. You, each and every employee or an external service provider must have a task and uh, be ready to support you. Preparedness is the critical function. When we go to slightly more details about the DRP, the disaster recovery. So in addition to cyber attack, 
you may have a situation that for whatever reason you cannot access the main con the main control room you may have a situation like we live in today that the control room may be affected not even a cyber attack how you are going to operate do you have an alternative control room maybe a control room in a remote facility maybe an emergency room in your headquarters but you need to be prepared. Alternative equipment. So we are here. We are already see, having a situation that the computer was infected, the program was infected. Can you, do you have in the standby mode another computer, hopefully updated with the latest information that you that you can connect it? Okay. Trained experts, sometimes this is very critical. Sometimes your experts cannot arrive to the facility. You need to be ready. Okay, if these people cannot arrive, I can bring from another department or another facility, bring some experts, especially in situations where we have today that the majority of people are not coming to work every day. We need to have a, a task team a task team because when things happen the most important is to work co properly and uh, as fast as possible updating your management is is very important updating your human resources is very important because they may help you to bring additional people from additional uh, facility and obviously you need a chief engineer who will handle the situation who can decide uh, who will lead the, the drp drp activity uh, as uh, effectively as possible when you talk about the uh, uh, the risk mitigation obviously the drp uh, is a uh, is a sort of situation that you cannot mitigate the risk it already happened so you need to rely on a redundancy you need to rely on a immediately installing some complementing security measures so for example you see that your uh, your connection to the to remote uh, service people is damaged you need to have an alternative solution there are plenty of technical technological solutions there is no a, a magic formula you need to uh, build your program specifically according to your facility and, uh, and your plant when we are dealing with uh, with uh, disaster recovery we need to have a strong process of how to block the process of cyber incident because we may detect it when it happens but we know that that cyber attack does not happen in a fraction of a second it start and then it can laterally move uh, across your organization so what you are going to do for example when we had this in, this uh, incident in israel the instruction was immediately uh, 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 disconnect all the facilities from any kind of remote access immediately disconnect obviously it helped to some facilities and for some facilities uh, it was already too late i want to say something very important control shutdown of industrial processes we 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 know that any kind of intervention to industrial process can cause a higher damage than the cyber attack itself so we need to be well pre well prepared with the process if we decide that the process is out of control we decide how and the decision is to shut down the operation you need to you need to know and you need to be practice how you are going to shut it down and obviously uh, all the time you need to uh, conduct assessment every minute you need the situation may change may change and you need to report to experts who may help you fast recovery we already discussed uh, this topic during the during the the previous previous slide so i want to say 
that you must be, be familiar with your normal process. Where is your baseline? Baseline, this, this needs to be very, very clear to all people involved. I already mentioned that any kind of panic intervention may cause a huge problem. So if you decide to make an intervention, you need to have a emergency model and you need to know that we are going to switch the facility to some slower model or less efficient model, a, 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 a operating mode which needs less control and hopefully less not need remote access. Business continuity model, obviously we talk about it, and uh, be ready to repair the damage. When, when people check their facility, you know, when they went through this program and they said, okay, let's see where are we, let's, uh, let's examine our operation. And here is the short list of what they found. People believe that the facility is air gapped. And finally, they realize that there are all kinds of connections done by their own people. And there may be some cellular remote access by a maintenance guy, or uh, somebody did a temporary change and they forgot to remove it. So you may not know, but your facility is exposed to the internet. How can you find out? Just run the Shodan website and hope, and I hope you will not find your facility on the list exposed to access to the internet. Probably this is what happened to the, to the water facility in Israel, how they started to, to access the facility. Authentication. We all know about encryption, but in many cases, authentication is highly important. How you are going to authenticate using password, using two-factor authentication, using multiple uh, factor authentication. Uh, obviously, if you need to set up some certificate, it, it needs to be done with correct tools like the TLS 1.2 and so on. Need to be checked. We need to know if you have any vulnerable devices already connected and uh, you need to always be in contact with your service provider, the suppliers of your products and see, and see if there are any new announcements. Uh, and we always hear about a uh, Schneider PLC, Siemens PLC, other PLCs and remote terminal unities. Until yesterday, everything was okay. Suddenly, people, uh, there are researchers who are finding that uh, these uh, uh, PLCs uh, have some uh, um, weakness and uh, maybe even some zero day type uh, vulnerability, and the attackers can access your operation. So, when we deal with risk reduction, Long before we are worrying about the BCP and DRP, we need to talk about risk reduction is a continuous process, assessment, detection, improvement, problem solving, upgrades, patching when, when necessary, all this needs to be done uh, constantly. Uh, we, when we speak about risk reduction, we need to talk about, we all know that today we are buying commercial off-the-shelf product. Commercial off-the-shelf product, these are your uh, standard PCs uh, using uh, Microsoft normal or Linux operating uh, systems. And when you, when you receive or uh, programmable logic controllers or in, in intelligent electronic devices, when you receive these products, you may already uh, uh, need to, uh, to, to take an action. For example, they are coming with a very simple uh, factory setting, password like, uh, like admin, admin, and all kinds of very famous passwords. Why? Because it should be very easy for initial access and initial installation. But when you already program it for your own use, it must be changed to something 
that it's uh, it's more uh, secure. I want to say here something very important. Uh, when we have an operation and we have PLCs installed, people can obviously think it would be a great idea to have every PLC with a different password and different user identification. It would be great from security point of view. However, I must tell you, it does not happen. Why? It, people decide in this facility we will have one access and one password. Why they are doing it? It's, especially they are doing it for the disaster recovery. When something happens and you need to bring an expert on site, maybe a, your own expert or an external a, a expert who you don't want to spend time worrying, okay, okay, that PLC, here is the username and password. That PLC, here is the username and password. And spend time on mistakes. And so you don't want to do it. If you, if it's okay, if you have a small site with a, not too many PLCs, or you do grouping of PLCs, or we have the same username and password, I say it is not the best from cybersecurity point of view, but here we are talking about disaster recovery and the, and the effective action. The other uh, hardening is deactivate ports which are not needed. We all know how uh, computers are coming with many USB ports, Ethernet ports, uh, CD-ROM. Uh, all these can be an entrance gate for an attacker. So you must look at your architecture. If you say, I have four USB, but I need only one, okay? You should find a, a way to deactivate the others. And even the one that you may need for maintenance must be somehow protected. So uh, maybe with some cover or maybe with some uh, light glue that can be. So you don't want to have a situation that somebody, a cleaning person, will just uh, go by and plug in a USB very easily. So all ports which are not used need to be deactivated, and those which are used need to be somehow protected, so not, uh, not allow easy disconnect. Same, deactivate unused functions. You know, you can go to, to the BIOS of the computer and see which operation is needed, which operation is, no, is not needed. Uh, blocking the login capabilities. We, we, all, we all know that in operation, people may have different privileges, so you need to look at it. And uh, and the industrial control system must be well protected and not allow people who don't have the right privilege to connect it. Correcting non-security problem is very important, so eh, no need to repeat. I would like to talk eh, slightly about other standards. Here you see a slide with quite eh, many standards, each are applicable for different industry area. You can see the NIST 882, you can see the NERC-C applicable for power utilities and, uh, and so on. And you need to see a 62443. Uh, I'm going to talk about it in a minute, more details. The NIST framework, it's the good document that you can read. It's quite easy to read. And, and, help, and may guide you how to do things right. And what you read, read here in these paragraphs, uh, there are five uh, sections, and we already discussed them uh, during uh, the previous slide, identify the assets, protecting, detect deviation from normal, how you are going to do it, Respond effectively and accurately, of course, this is the BCP and a BCP and the recovery. This is the DRP, obviously, okay. Just a slide, a small slide on the 62443, as Chris mentioned, I'm preparing a, a, a longer presentation on that. And the, 
this is a very complicated uh, standard, no doubt. Many hundreds of pages and 14 sections and so on. But uh, if there is something I want you to know right now about this standard, that there are three stakeholders which must work together in order to achieve a good result. And one is the vendor of the components and the software, anything uh, that is uh, used to build the system. There is a system integrator who is responsible to build your system, update it and provide the service. And then you have the facility owner, the people who are operating the system and they are responsible about the BCP, DRP, obviously on the top of the normal operation. And these, these three stakeholders constantly must uh, do assessment, must check uh, what kind of new vulnerabilities are uh, detected. And uh, when something important is coming up, be ready to react, not in panic, not instantly, because every action, every change is a risk to operating safety and reliability. This is a very important message industrial control system must remember. Every change, software change, patching, update is the risk. And for those who are not yet familiar with the standard, I just want to show this. This is a very famous picture. Initially, there were 14 sections in this, uh, in this uh, standard. Now they are 15 because the 2.5 is new. And I already heard that there may be one more. And uh, understanding the standard will definitely help you to deal correctly and effectively with your own system. It will help you to, do have, to have effective interaction with your inter integrator, with your service provider, and most important, be better prepared. So this will, uh, this will end my short uh, presentation on these two important topics. Uh, uh, and uh, what can I say? Put security goals into your specification. Deal with vendors, integrators, component provider who take cyber cybersecurity seriously. Uh, people who comply with ISO 27001 is important. People who are aware of the 6244 is important. Don't compromise on security requirements because today, you may compromise, you may say, okay, this may be not so important. However, tomorrow it will be a new vulnerability. And the most difficult challenge is obviously to be ready for tomorrow's challenges because we don't know what to expect. Things are happening every day. So thank you very much. Any, if there are any questions, then uh, Chris kindly let me know. If, my email is written on, on the bottom, so anyone who would like to send me a question related to this topic or any other topic related to industrial control cybersecurity, please feel free doing it and I will do my best because secure, uh, I want to summarize it, very important. The cybersecurity is a strong precondition to operating safety. And physical security, physical perimeter security is a strong precondition to cyber security. So here you have physical security, cyber security, uh, and safety all glued together. And this is the role of uh, the operators of industrial control system. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Dan. I'll, I'll invite it out to the uh, the audience there. If anyone's got a question, either uh, just post your question or raise your hand. I think one thing I wanted to, to also highlight, Daniel, in terms of your experience, it's a very specialised field, cybersecurity and industrial control systems, um, even from the context of even, you know, someone coming in from cybersecurity, but also from the engineering uh, aspect, from the safety aspect. How many in your experience have the required skills in both of these areas. It's a very niche area of the sector, yeah? 
Yes, one of the bigger biggest problems is that we are, that we are facing that uh, that uh, there are not enough not too many people who already study at the industrial control system cybersecurity expertise and in many organizations we see that uh, the responsibility is under the IT expert. And although I didn't show you the, the slide, but there is a huge difference between how we deal with IT systems and how we deal with industrial control system from many aspects. The biggest mistake anyone can make is to, is to use IT cybersecurity practices and bring them to the industrial control field. It's not a matter of just switching it off and on again. Uh, for a, uh, a utility or a, a, a water plant. Um, look, Daniel, there is no uh, further questions, so we'll leave it there. And as you pointed out, um, we will raise some more sessions on 62443 uh, later on uh, for the audience also. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run through uh, what is coming up with my security media. Uh, I'm just going to take it back uh, from Daniel there. And we have coming up, um, well, for those that attended last week, and I can see some people did attend last week, just one moment. Uh, we had Tarag Joshi last week, so if you happen to miss that uh, from last week, one second, here it comes. Um, that is available now on, on YouTube. So uh, the security awareness for a remote workforce that uh, Tarag walked through uh, with that. Uh, I raised, um, we've had uh, Dan on our podcast channel before. Um, and uh, we've also got a number of episodes that we've just done. We just did one with Infobox this week, uh, again, on securing that remote workers uh, in the age of technical uh, teleworking. And I'm also interviewing Professor Rory Medcalf this week uh, on his book, Contest for the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and again, if we consider cyber security and national security together, uh, that should be a, a very interesting one as well, particularly in the, the current climate. Um, and I just appeared on uh, Thought Leadership webinars in London with uh, Professor Martin Gill. These are every Tuesday and Thursday. They are available online as well. We will be carrying these webinars on our YouTube channel, uh, but they're available to, to monitor as well. Uh, and as it happens, we've got Martin Gill on next Tuesday. Uh, we're going to look at it from the offender's viewpoint. Martin is a, uh, a renowned criminologist uh, and has spoken to offenders uh, all across different um, crime types, I suppose. So it's, I think it's an important thing from a security professional's viewpoint uh, to understand the offender's uh, motivations uh, and capabilities also. So that's on uh, next Tuesday and a slightly different time at uh, 5 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Uh, on next week also is the continuation of Shemaine Tan's um, mega C-suite virtual meetup editions uh, and we've got uh, Mahiko Matsubura from uh, Tokyo and Magda Celli from Singapore also. So if uh, you're part of the meetup crew, uh, no doubt you'll attend that one also. Uh, this particular session will be available on My Security TV. Uh, we've got a few thousand um, subscribers on that channel and there's a lot of content on there, both from a webinar perspective, uh, but then also just general videos that, uh, that I, I see and uh, we, we posted on there. So uh, plenty of content and uh, plenty to watch. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending this virtual education series uh, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you very much for attending.